Well, it's time for us to start tonight. We appreciate everyone being here. Appreciate those joining us online. Uh, just so that I just have to tell you one time, I had surgery today on my hand. Uh, Diane says she's not sure if my mind's ready to teach class, so don't ask any hard questions. Three hours ago, I was sedated, so <laughs> we'll see what happens tonight. I'm going to try to remember what I studied for our lesson, though. We are studying in the book of Jeremiah. We're ready for chapter 29. Uh, we will begin with a word of prayer. Our Lord God, we just thank you for all you give us and all you do for us. We're thankful for uh, your love and thankful for this opportunity we have to come together and study your word. And we pray that as we study that we'll always make application to our own lives and look honestly at our hearts and make sure that we're putting you first and living for you. We're, we're mindful, Father, of those that are sick and thankful that some are getting better and recovering, some are taking treatments, and we just pray, Lord, that you'll be with each one and, and give them your strength and your power, and we pray that you'll help us all just to trust you in all we do. Forgive us when we do wrong, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We talked last, actually last week and then a couple of weeks before that, we talked about the fact that Judah uh, had, had not been faithful and, and the king of Babylon came down. He took uh, King Jeconiah, uh, or is that right, Jeconiah or Jehoiakim? Je Jeconiah, yeah. He took Jeconiah uh, back to Babylon with the queen mother and he, uh, he appointed uh, a new king, uh, Zedekiah, to be king over Judah. And we mentioned last week, if you'll remember, Zedekiah had sent for Jeremiah and had uh, asked him to pray for him. He sent for Jeremiah on another occasion and uh, secretly and said, does the Lord have a word for, for me? And, and, and so we talked about the fact that, that perhaps Jeconiah, uh, I'm sorry, not Jeconiah, Zedekiah, uh, it might affect my memory a little bit. We'll see. <laughs> anyway, one of them kings, uh, King Zedekiah, uh, I also took a pain pill right before I came to church. <laughs> Uh, but I'm standing up. <laughs> uh, just anyway, so you won't have to ask later, I had a tri what's called a trigger finger uh, is what I had wrong with my aunt. Uh, and they go in there and fix it. And, and so anyway, that's what I had. Um, but, but Zedekiah, even though he was not faithful to God, even though he worshiped Baal, even though he, he did all these terrible things, he actually protected Jeremiah, uh, took him out of the dungeon, put him in a place to, uh, he still kept him as a prisoner, but not in nearly as se severe conditions. Uh, made sure he had food to eat. Uh, and, and he did call on the Lord at least a couple of times that, that it tells us about. And so I think, that as we mentioned last week, I think deep down inside, Zedekiah knew that God is God. He knew that, that what Jeremiah was prophesying was true. But for whatever reason, he was not willing to repent. He was not willing to change. He was not willing to do what he ought to do. And we talked about that a little bit last week. And, and maybe it was the, the political aspect of it. Maybe he was afraid of the people. Maybe, uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly why he, he wouldn't do it. But it just seems uh, from what we read that Zedekiah really did believe, but he just really wouldn't do what he knew he needed to do. And that, that sort of plays a part in what we're seeing here tonight. Our lesson tonight is a letter that God tells Jeremiah to write and send it to those who are captive over in Babylon. And Zedekiah actually sends the letter uh, by one of his messengers over to the king of Babylon to give to these people that the letter's written to. So he, he's actually assisting Jeremiah in doing what God tells Jeremiah to do. And, and, and I find that interesting, and yet 
I have known people, in fact, I work with a guy whose wife is a Christian, his family's, his mother and daddy are Christians, and, and his, most of his family are Christians. He's not. Uh, and yet, on more than one occasion, he has gotten in religious discussions with people there at work and called me to come join him in the discussion to try to prove to them what the Bible teaches about uh, the plan of salvation and baptism and so on and other things like that. And yet, he has told me more than one time, he said, I know if I die, I'm going to hell. Uh, and, and I've questioned him on numerous occasions, you know, why don't you do something about it? And, and he's never really given me a reason uh, why. And I don't know why. I, I really don't. I, I know him pretty well. I've worked with him for, for almost 20 years. And, uh, and, and yet, I don't really understand why he's, what it is that keeps him from doing it, uh, from obeying the gospel and, and, and serving the Lord. And so this, this is not a, an unusual phenomenon. And there's, there's, I've met other people in my life that were the same way, that, uh, that knew that they, they were lost, they knew what they needed to do to be saved, and yet they wouldn't do it. Uh, many, many years ago when I was a kid, there was a man here in town who was... Uh, an alcoholic and, and he'd, he'd been in a lot of different kinds of trouble and stuff and, and he came in the bookstore one day and told daddy uh, he, said, he said when I die I want you to preach my funeral for me uh, and he said I'll tell you what I want you to say he said just tell everybody that I've gone to hell and I don't want them to go there uh, and you know you, you have to wonder if somebody understands that, why don't they do something about it? You know, why don't they change? Why don't they repent? Why don't they turn to the Lord? And, and, and I, don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But it seems that that's the way Jeconiah, uh, Zedekiah is. Uh, that, that he understands, he believes, he knows, but he's just not willing to do it. Not willing to change. Uh, but uh, I, I just... To me, that's a. That's a. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, Satan does, through some kind of false logic, to convince them to, to not do what they need to do and know they need to do. You know, Satan is a master liar and deceiver, and he can convince people to to hold on to the lie that, that damns them. And, uh, you know, and I don't understand, but I don't, I don't understand why somebody wouldn't be willing to. You know, if, if I've known of situations where somebody was involved in some particular sin and they knew they were wrong, but they were not willing to give up that sin, whatever it was. Uh, and, and so they say, okay, I'm, I, I understand, but I, I want to do what I'm doing. I'm not willing to give it up. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, even if it does cause me to be lost. And at least I can understand the logic of it. I don't agree with it, but I can understand the logic of that. Uh, but when somebody can't even give you a good reason for why they, they won't change, I, I don't understand the logic of that. that uh, but anyway, that... Uh, it, it, that just, to me, is a sort of mind-boggling. Anyway, uh, Jeremiah sends this letter. And, and who were the specified, this question number one, who were the specified recipients of this letter from God through Jeremiah? It's first of all the... To the of the elders who were Okay. To the elders who were taken captive, but also to the... Priests and also prophets. Okay, so uh, there, and, and I, I wonder if these prophets are talking about the false prophets that he uh, talks about later in this chapter, or if he's talking about maybe some that were prophets that were actually true prophets. Uh, in, in fact, if uh, later on in this same chapter, he said, I've, I have sent my word through the prophets over and over and over again. 
And a lot of times I think that when we, we talk about prophets, you know, we think about, okay, Jeremiah's a prophet or Isaiah's a prophet or, you know, Daniel prophesied. And, and we think about these, you know, Habakkuk or some of these others. And we think about these prophets that we know their names. But what we need to understand is that there were hundreds of prophets that are never named. Uh, in fact, if you'll remember, uh, during the time of Elijah, that he had a school of prophets that had 50-something prophets in it. Uh, and and when, it, in, when Elijah, remember, thought he was all alone and he was the last one serving God, and uh, God said, no, you know, that I've, I forget how many, what the number was, but it was 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. Uh, and, and the number of those were, in fact, prophets. So, the, so there were a lot of prophets that are named, that are not named, but that, that prophesied all through the years. Uh, you remember the, the story of the young prophet that came to, and prophesied against the king, and he was told not to go back the same way and not to stay and not to eat, but the old prophet told him to. Well, there's two prophets that we don't know their names. Uh, and, and so there's just there's there's lots and lots of prophets, and God sent these prophets for what reason? What was their purpose? They were his messengers, they were his messengers and it was for to warn the people to, to to turn away from their idols and serve God. I mean that that was the purpose, and so it wasn't like God you know ever fifty years God sent a prophet. That, that's not the way it was. It was prophets all the time preaching to these people all the time, telling them what they were doing wrong and that they needed to change. Uh, and so I, I don't know, I said all that because I was talking about prophets, I don't know if these prophets that are addressed here are some of those kind of prophets that were true prophets, but they were taken captive, or if they were false prophets. Why would true prophets be taken captive? If captivity was punishment, why would prophets that were true prophets be taken captive? Do what? No, uh, I don't. I don't think that would be why. I, I think it was because all of this captivity is God's doing. It, it has to do with what God's plan was. I think it was. Okay, yeah, to to preserve the word of God even in captivity. And so, so God sent prophets, even in captivity, while they were there, God sent prophets to them to help them try to change and, and to turn back to Him and, and so on. God said that He'd always keep a remnant of His people. Yeah, okay. Right, yeah. So, so I think that, that God probably did send, send some true prophets along with the captivity to, for this purpose, to help teach them and, and show them the right way and so on. And that's, of course, that's speculation, but that's my thinking. Name the two by whom this letter was sent. Do I? Me pronounce it? <laughs> okay, verse 3. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisha, the son of Shaphan, and Jemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon. Now, who authorized them? And I just read that. Who was it? Zedekiah, okay, king of Judah. So, so we see that, that Zedekiah sends two of his messengers with, with this letter uh, over to Babylon. And this, this goes back to what we was talking about just a minute ago. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. My guess would be no, but that doesn't mean it. Yeah. Chapter 1, verse 1, the words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, of the priest who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. Because uh, their names, even, you know, of course, I know that they were even, you know, when you see. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's possible. I'd, 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 yeah. I've, Right, yeah, and, and, 
and without any way of substantiating it one way or the other, I'd say we got a 50-50 chance of saying yes or no. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, obviously there were multiple people with same names. You know, how many how many people have you met named Fred or John or Bill or you know whatever? So so there's you know there's always been multiple people with same names. You know. There were I think three different Marys that traveled with Jesus. So you know. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it, I mean, it could have been. I I hadn't I didn't notice that, so I didn't know. But yeah. So Jim Mariah, it is possible that he was a brother of. Uh, hold on, just a minute. I've got a footnote here, or a reference that I'm looking. In 1 Chronicles 6 and verse 13, Shalom became the father of Hilkiah, and Hilkiah became the father of Azariah. Uh, and then Azariah became the father of Sarai, Sarai, became the father of Jehozadak, and Jehozadak was among those taken captive. Uh, which, that with the time frame there could, could very well be the same hill cow, but I'd, uh, yeah. The word, just how you the word. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I have no way of, no way of knowing. All right, complete the following phrase telling the people in captivity what to do. First of all, he told them to build what? Build houses and do what? Dwell in them or live in them. Okay. And then he said to do what? Plant gardens and eat the fruit or eat the produce. He told them, marry wives, let your sons and daughters marry, so your number will blank, not blank. So it will increase or grow and not decrease. Okay. Now, what is all that saying? Yeah. Okay. This is sort of the introduction to him telling them uh, the next question. What length of time is inferred by these instructions? Okay, a long time. Years, yeah. Yeah, generations, yeah. He's, he's saying here, this is not going to be something, and we're going to see later that some of the false prophets... We're saying that this captivity is going to be very short and in just a very short time you're going to go back to your homeland. But Jeremiah is telling them, or God is telling them through Jeremiah, that's not the case. What you need to understand is you're there for your life. I mean, these people that were taken captive that were adults were going to be there for the rest of their life. So he's saying you're here for the rest of your life. You might as well just settle in and, and build you a house and plant you a garden and go on with life because and let you, you know, your kids get married and uh, because you're there. You're not leaving in there. You're going to be there for the rest of your life. Uh, and so this is, it's inferred that this is for a long time. Now, the captives in Babylon were further instructed from the Lord to do what? S something of the city. Do what? Seek the, peace. Seek the peace of the city. Somebody have another word there, different translation? Right. Okay, well, we'll get to that, yeah. The, the New American Standard says seek the prosperity. Uh, but but it's, it's basically the same, and I'll come back to that in just a minute. He says, seek the peace or seek the prosperity of the city where I have done what? Okay, cause you to be, or, or one, one translation just says, where I sent you into exile. Uh, and do what for it? Pray. Pray for it, 
For in the blank shall you have blank. Okay, in the peace you shall have peace. Or if your translation said in the prosperity, you shall have prosperity. Now, what is he saying there to seek the, the peace or the prosperity of the city? Okay, yeah. He's saying, basically what he's saying here is, you're, you have been taken into exile, and, and this is not your homeland. But I want you just to settle in, you're going to live there, and I want you to be good citizens. Do everything you can. Don't always, you know, don't be a rebel rouser. Don't be somebody that's always, you know, got a grudge on your shoulder because you were taken captive. Don't create problems. Just try to make it the best city that you can possibly make it because you're there. And the better the, the city is as far as peace and prosperity and all of that, the better off you're going to be. And, and one of the interesting things is while God has so many times condemned putting our trust in riches and in material things and in wealth, He has also told us numerous times, and, and even in the New Testament, that we are to enjoy what He has given us. God, God never intended for us to, you know, to, to live without any kind of enjoyment with the things that we have. He says, enjoy what He has given you. So there's nothing wrong in, in having material possessions and enjoying them and, and using them for our own personal benefit to, to have a good life. God never intended that we not do that. Uh, in fact, that's one of the things that he told the children of Israel over and over and over again was if you'll serve me and you'll trust me and you'll live for me, follow my commandments, then I will bless you and you will be prosperous and, and your barns will overflow and you, you'll have so many livestock you won't be able to count them. In other words, he says, I'm going to give you a really good life. Uh, and, and so God never intended that we not enjoy life or enjoy material things in life. And yet, at the same time, He has warned us over and over again, don't put your trust in material things and don't make that your goal because we're here temporarily. Uh, and we're eventually going to leave it all behind. Uh, and so he, he says, you know, be content with what you have. Uh, and sometimes we take that to mean that we're not supposed to try to get more, but that's not what he's saying. He's just saying whatever circumstance you're in, make the best of it and rejoice in the Lord and enjoy what, what God has given you. Uh, in fact, I have... Was, was this command contingent on having a righteous ruler? No, because Nebuchadnezzar was not a righteous ruler. Uh, and, and the people under him were not. Uh, I, I have often wondered if sometimes people that have less are not happier than the people that have more. Uh, you know, we, we, we sort of equate wealth with happiness but if you look at uh, people that are, are extremely wealthy, most of them have broken homes and most of them have problems with their kids and most of them have problems, all kinds of legal problems as well as personal problems in their lives. And uh, I, I was telling Diane today, it's, it, to me, it's really, really sad when you, you think about some people that have, you know, what we call made it in life and been famous people, uh, and yet their whole life was filled with all kinds of troubles. We were listening, actually at the time I said that, we were listening to a song, a religious song by Johnny Cash. Uh, and, and Johnny Cash, if you study his life, you read anything about him, he was a very spiritual man. And he was, he was, uh, he, he really had a heart of wanting to do what was right, and yet there's not anybody that had more problems in life with, with, sinful things than did Johnny Cash, you know. Uh, and yet he, he had that struggle all the time because of it. Uh, Elvis Presley was another one. He, he was a deeply religious man. Uh, and yet 
he had all kinds of issues and problems that that made it difficult for him to to really serve God at all. And uh, and and you know you have to I, I feel for for those kind of people because you know the world looks at them and says boy they've got it made they've you know they've really been successful and look how wonderful they are and, and yet their whole life was filled with with trouble. Uh, are Christians to pray for civil governments even if they're not good ones? Yes. Why? Do what, Jim? Respect for their position. Okay. What'd you say, Dwight? Because we're a part of it. Because the Bible says so. <laughs> if there's no other reason, just because the Bible said to, you know, uh, at least uh, two different places I know of that specifically says that, and then there's others besides that that tell us that we are are to pray for the government, uh, and and. Paul says uh, that, to Timothy that, that we're to pray for rulers that we might have a, a quiet and peaceable life. This goes back to the peace and prosperity he was talking about a while ago. Uh, he says pray for, for people today. That's what he told them to pray for, and that's what we're to pray for. Uh, and, and, of course, you know, it, it is troubling when you have leaders that are ungodly and you have leaders that are promoting ungodly agendas uh, and, and even in some countries, anti-God agendas. Uh, and, and yet, at the same time, if that's where we are living and that's our country, then we need to be praying for them and we need to be asking God to, to help them to, to want to do what's right. After... Reading and rereading the instructions given in verse 7 and verses 8 through 10, make a guess based on those verses as to what the false prophets were probably telling the people. Okay, that everything's good? What else you think you might be? Anybody have any other guess? Okay, God, God was telling them to seek peace and prosperity. Maybe they were leading rebellions against, you know, constantly leading rebellions against the, the Babylonian government. Uh, and that's, that, would be, that would be a natural thing to have at least a faction of the captives wanting to be, you know, like the zealots were in the New Testament times. They were always, you know, like guerrilla warfare against the uh, the Roman government, and so it would be natural for some of the captives to want to do that and to fight against the Babylonian government, and, and that maybe that's what it was. I think there's also, if you go back and look at what we read earlier uh, in verses uh, 6 and 7, Jeremiah's telling them that their captivity is going to be what? A long time. And so, so my, my guess was that probably the false prophets were saying, it's going to be a short captivity. It's not going to last very long. Uh, probably after just uh, sound like somebody having fun. Do what? Oh, they, it's okay. You have to remember they're kids. That's a grandparent speaking. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. Okay. Well, this one says, do not listen to the dreams which they dream. The New American Standard does. So it's, it's, it's saying that it's these false prophets and diviners that are having these false dreams and they're saying, hey, we dream this and this is what it means and, and so on. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not sure why the difference in the wording, but that's, 
That's what the, the New American Standard says. Uh, because if you look at verse 9, the very next sentence, For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. So it seems to me that, that what he's saying here is that these false prophets are saying, hey, God spoke to us and this is what God said. Or we had this dream and God said this dream means this when in fact it didn't mean that and they, God didn't speak to them. Uh, and so they're, they're false prophets. That, it seems to me that that's what's, what's being said. Or anything else on that? Okay. How many years would the captivity last? Seventy years. Okay. This is prophesied actually actually a long time before this happens. God had prophesied that the captivity was going to last seventy years. God told them when they were taken, this captivity is going to last 70 years. And when you get over to Ezra and Nehemiah, you find that the 70 years came about and God said, okay, it's time to send them back. And so in 70 years, they go back to Judah. That's when they begin the, the, the exit of Babylon uh, and the Medo-Persians and go back to uh, go back to Judah. What verse is that in? It says 20. I think it's 19, isn't it? For, verse 10? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, verse 10. Thus says the Lord, when 70 years have completed for Babylon, I'll visit you, fulfill my good work. There's one of these questions that I know. I noticed it was one verse off, and that's why I said maybe it was verse 19. I thought maybe that was it, but it wasn't. Um, verse 19 is the one that I was referring to earlier. He says, Because they've not listened to my words, declares the Lord, which I sent to them again and again by my servants, the prophets, but you did not listen. And so God says, I've, Over and over and over, I've sent these prophets to you. And that's, that's the verse I was thinking about when I said that. Okay, and, and the 70 years was because that's how many Sabbath years they had ignored as a nation. Every, every seventh year they were supposed to let the land rest for a year and they had not been doing that. And so uh, I think that that's, I think that I'm pretty sure there's a place that actually tells us that and that's part of it. Uh, it's why the 70 years. True or false, God intended only evil toward the exiles. That's false. Uh, yeah, I'd say verse 20 in that previous question is a typo because this one is verse 11. So it just, it, that's typographical error. Uh, but if you look at verse 11, he says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. Uh, and I, I, I sort of underlined and, and wrote in the book there the word hope. You know, they, here they were taken captive. They'd been take, carried away. You know, today we'd call that prisoner of war. Uh, and they, they were taken and they were displaced into a, a different country to live. Uh, away from their own people, you know, with other nations around them. Uh, and, and yet God says, don't give up hope. I'm, I'm giving you, I'm promising you that there's going to be a future and there is hope. Uh, all right. Question number nine. Those who blank upon the Lord and blank unto Him. Those who call upon the, the Lord and pray unto Him. He will, he will listen or hear. Okay. 
He will hearken, listen, hear, depending on translation you have. And, and what he's saying there, and this is a principle that's all the way through the Bible, if, if we will call on God and pray to God, God will hear us. He'll listen to us. Uh, those who blank and blank for him with all blank and blank, blank. Okay, those who, those who seek and search for him uh, with all their hearts will... Okay, Jesus said, Knock and it will be opened. Seek, you'll find. Ask, it'll be given. Uh, and, and so, only that's the wrong order. Is ask and seek and knock is the order that he said it in. Uh, and the way you remember that that's the order is because of the word ask. It's A-S-K. Those that ask and those that seek and those that, that knock. Uh, but, but Jesus says the same thing. If, if we are willing to call on the Lord with all our heart, then God's going to hear us. Uh, and that's, that's just a principle that's, that's found all the way through Scripture. Who in Babylon would teach them the way of the Lord? Okay, the prophets. And this goes back to what I was talking about a while ago. Uh, he says, I'll be found by you and I'll restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations, from all the places I've driven you, declares the Lord, and I'll bring you back into exile. Uh, and then verse 15, because you have said the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon. Uh, and, and so God did, in fact, give them prophets. We mentioned a couple last week uh, that, uh, well, no, here's this, this, this is the question. Name two notable possibilities. Two, two prophets that we know of for sure that were in captivity. Daniel's first one that we think of immediately, okay. Ezekiel, yeah. Ezekiel. I cheated and looked at the teacher's manual. I knew Daniel was one of them, but I didn't think. Do what? In the front of the book, it's there, okay. Well, he wasn't actually taken captive, though. This is talking about the ones that were in captivity. He was in the time of captivity, but he was not taken in captivity. Okay, but yeah, these, those two are, are, we know specifically, there, as I said, there were others that were not as well known. Those still in Judah with the king who refused to hear the words of the Lord would be saved in their own land anyway. True or false? That's false. Okay. Uh, verses uh, 16 through 19, uh, he says, Concerning these people that are in your city and the ones that did not go into exile, uh, he says, Behold, I'm sending upon them the sword, famine, pestilence. I'll make them like split open figs that cannot be eaten due to rottenness. I'll pursue them with the, for with the sword, with famine, with pestilence. I'll make them a terror to all the kingdoms of the earth to be a curse, a horror, a hissing, and a reproach among all the nations where I've driven them because they have not listened to my words, declares the Lord. Uh, and so, you know, he just, he, sa he says they're going to be destroyed. Uh, some of the people, actually the ones that were taken captive were the ones that were better off because the ones that were left either were so, so bad off that they didn't do very well or else, Many of them were destroyed. Now, there were some that did live and, and continued to live in the land, but very few. Who, are, who were the two lying prophets? Okay, Ahab is one. Zedekiah is another one. Okay. Uh, and this is not the king Ahab, and this is not the Zedekiah uh, that's the king. This is... Two lying prophets. And what would happen to them? Okay. They'd be killed by Nebuchadnezzar, it says. Yeah, roasted in a fire. That's, uh, that's a bad way to die, isn't it? He says not only are they going to die, but it's going to be a, a, a big open show when they die, and everybody's going to see it. Uh, and, and so it's not just a matter of, you know, they're going to be, be put to death, but God's going to demonstrate His vengeance on them. 
briefly tell what Shimei, Shimei and the Halamite had done in his own name and, and the claims he made. What, what did they do? Do you remember? Would you write it down? They had, they had sent a letter back to Judah and what was in the letter? Yeah, they, they named their own high priest is basically what they did. They, you know, the Jehoiada was supposed to be the high priest and they said, well, he's not the priest. You know, this is, this is supposed to be the priest. Uh, and Jeremiah's crazy, don't listen to him. He's a mad prophet. Uh, he's crazy. Uh, and or one translation says insane. Uh, so uh, what? Uh, I tell you what, let's do. Why don't we stop right there, and we will pick up with question thirteen because I want to talk about it uh, some more. Uh, then we got time to talk about. Uh, and and by the way, uh, the last part of question thirteen: What was false that was said? Uh, the only translation I found that you can answer that question from is the King James. Uh, no, just the old King James is the only one that I found that I. You found it. Oh, well, it's, it's, it's not stated. It's sort of an implication. Uh, yeah. And again, I, I, I use the teacher's manual to find the answer for that one too. So.
sing the first, second, third, and sixth verse.
you allowing us to come out here tonight and study another portion of your word and sing songs of praise unto you. Father, we don't know everything that we're supposed to know, and we don't know why you do things and operate the way you do. But Father, we pray that you will give us our understanding of why you do things, and we pray that you will help us to always put you first in our lives and that we will go to the scriptures and that we will learn how to uh, be good Christians and that you will mold us into the Christians that you would have us to be. Father, we have several with our, uh, of our number that are sick. Brother Vernon Provines, please bless him. And Brother Joyce Brooks, is, she's sick as well and recovering. We pray that you will be with both of the, them and that they will be a, a fast and speedy recovery. Father, we pray that you will be with the ones that's lost loved ones, that you will comfort them, that you will be with the speaker of the hour, and he will um, say something that might bring uh, somebody's lost soul's heart, that they can come to you tonight. Father, we pray that you will purify our hearts and purify our minds, that we can get rid of all the garbage that we hear every day in the world, and that we can focus on you. Forgive us of our sins, Father, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our song of invitation will be number 655. In Luke chapter 15 and verse 11 through the end of the chapter, we're given the parable of the prodigal son. And uh, we all know the, how the story goes. The young man uh, got his inheritance and went off and, and spent it all, wasted it all, probably on something stupid. And it said it came to his senses when he was in a pig's eye. Uh, and he, he said to himself, you know, I can go back to my father's house and be a servant. And I think we've all had those kind of moments when we've done something stupid in our lives and we're regretting that we're going to have to tell our parents, you know, that I, I've done something stupid and that we're thinking to ourselves the whole time, you know, what am I going to say and how am I going to break it to him? Well, he did, and he goes back to his, his father, and his father, it, he, it says that he saw him off in a distance and he welcomed him back with open arms and, you know, put all the best robes and rings on him and had a big feast. And the story goes on uh, talking about the other son. But in this parable, I always think about this parable about how the father, his reaction to the son is exactly how God the father's reaction to us when we come back to him. And, and to anyone who's been lost and comes back to him and that how God, he welcomes us back with open arms. And it doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter how long we've been from God. He's always ready and willing to be there to welcome us back with open arms. As long as we have the same attitude as the son did, he had to humble himself and he had to come to his senses. And when we, whether we sin, you know, shortly, whether we are living in sin constantly or we have just completely abandoned God, when we come back to God, when we have that humble heart, that humble attitude, when we come back to God and ask Him for forgiveness, he's, he's there willing to forgive us. And He forgives us and He forgets. And that's, to me, that that's just shows us how much our God loves us and how much He is willing to forgive us and how much He wants us to be in heaven with Him. And so, as, as we think about how, how loving God is and how much forgiveness He has, you know, if whether you sin, you know, have shortcomings that you're living in sin or, or maybe you've completely abandoned God, you know that you can go back to God at any time He'll forgive you of your sins. And what a blessing that is. And, and we can live through our lives with that peace of knowing that whatever we do, we can always go back to God and He'll forgive us as long as we're Christians. And so tonight, if you're not a Christian, unfortunately, you don't have that blessing that you can go to God and ask Him for forgiveness. And so tonight, as we do every Sunday, every Wednesday that we come together, we offer an invitation for those who are not a Christian. And we urge you to do so, not trying to force you to become a Christian, but we want to encourage you to make that decision because we all know that our lives could end at any moment. And if you're not in Christ, unfortunately, if you were to die, you would be lost in hell. And so we want to encourage you to become a Christian. So tonight, if you need to become a Christian, or maybe you need to come and ask prayers 
uh, for the congregation. We'd love to assist you in any way we can. And so as we sing the imitation song, if you need to come, please do. There's a fountain of bridges for you and me. Let us
when I figured, but I didn't want to get there. And I mean, some people do. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. you. I am. I'm just so tired. <laughs> it's not one thing, it's another. Thank <laughs> you.